Hello and welcome to the Monday, April 11th, 2011 City Council Informational. We'll call the uh, meeting to order. We'll start off with our City Council staff report from Deborah A. Owen, City Clerk, Chief of Council Operations. Thank you and good afternoon, Sioux Falls City Council. Just one item to brief you on for tonight's 7 o'clock meeting, and that is there's been a request to withdraw item number 14, which is a resolution vacating the public right-of-way on Avenue, on North F Avenue. Um, and that's just a, actually we'll come back later to the council at some point in time down the road, but the request is to withdraw that. So when you adopt the regular agenda tonight, we request that you would remove that item number 14 uh, from your consideration and that is all I have for my updates. Thank you very much Any questions for Deborah? <clears throat> okay, very good seeing none. Thank you If we could uh, move on to our fiscal committee Councilor chair Fiscal committee chair Councilor Brown. <laughs> do you have an update you'd like to share with us? Yes, I think most of the council members were here or stayed for the meeting last week after the informational, but we reviewed the contract ordinance draft, and uh, we look forward to any input on that draft as we try to form that into something to propose to the full council. And then we also had an update on the budget analyst position and how that's moving forward. Any questions for Councillor Brown or any other fiscal committee members? Okay, seeing none. Uh, we we do have public services committee uh, meeting next. After this meeting, uh, any preview of that, Councillor Brown or Councillor Anderson, that you'd like to share with us? Sure. Uh, we will be uh, reviewing council procedures and organization. Uh, we'll also be uh, reviewing the revisions to the pawn shop ordinance. Uh, we have revisions from both the uh, police department and from the business community to take a look at. And then uh, also amendments to Chapter 5, Alcoholic Beverages. We'll be uh, trying to get through most of that as, as we can today. And I'm also going to request to the committee members that we move uh, item number 5 to... Uh, <clears throat> to the first item in the agenda. So you want to deal with the alcoholic uh, beverages issues first? Yes. Okay. That way we can have the rest of the time for the pawn shop ordinance. I'll also probably be asking to have the council procedures and organizations deferred at this time. That's something we need a little more time to review. Okay, City Clerk Owen. Thank you, Council Chair Jamison. Um, I also was going to say for the for the amendments to Chapter 5 alcoholic beverages being considered by the committee today, some of those are somewhat time sensitive because they would go into effect prior to Memorial Day weekend if it is the wishes of the council to make those revisions. And so I think the council will be taking or that committee will be taking action today on those on those ordinances if it's the will of of the committee. Otherwise, you won't. The adoption dates and the effective dates won't uh, will take effect after Memorial Day weekend. So, thank you. Okay, so item five is time sensitive. Correct. Okay, very good. Any questions for uh, Councillor Anderson or that committee? All right, seeing none, we'll move on to our City Council open discussion. Anybody have anything they'd like to bring up, Councillor Brown? <coughs> I just again wanted to publicly thank our staff for the, the bang up job they did on our Tuesday night forum. Uh, great attendance, uh, 140 people signed in. The venue was perfect, and, and I thought it struck a really good tone with the community in terms of uh, just discussing the merits of an event center. So, thanks to our staff, I thought that went very well. Yes, I would like to chime in as well with uh, maybe a little special thanks for Tamara and her effort to keep track of all the questions that were asked, even sitting up there not having to do anything else but listen. I struggled sometimes to keep focused on what the question really was and if, sometimes if there was a question. But Now, I received all those questions in a uh, Word document. Has everybody else had a chance to get those? Okay. And there were a group of emails sent to us prior to that event regarding the uh, 
email questions that came in by email. I don't think we've populated those together, but we should probably get that out as well and just formulate a, uh, a, a true picture of all the questions asked. I think most all the questions were answered. If, if we're missing something, you read through them, make sure we cover that. But uh, we'll include the other questions and get those to the clerk's office and then maybe resend out that list so you can save them together. But uh, I think some of the questions were asked about things that have been decided a long time ago. So covering them again wasn't really necessary. Any other items for open discussion? I have a couple, <clears throat> if I could. We have a couple items, you know, that we're going to be discussing. The uh, raising the rates for the uh, sewer rates, essentially, and the water rates uh, later. I think all of us have received a few emails or phone calls regarding this topic. And I've been trying to give it as much soul searching as I can. And I just thought it would be fair to bring up some discussion, you know, about how do we fight, how do we as a council fight to keep water rates low and sewer rates low for people? How do we do that? And, you know, we've kind of bought off on this idea that enterprise funds are, are only going to charge what their expenses are. And that's just fair. And that seems like the rational way to do it. And I do believe it is. I'm just thinking that perhaps our method of scrutinizing uh, and m controlling these rates is to maybe do a better job of scrutinizing the expenses involved in these enterprise accounts. I think by most accounts we just kind of give them a, a free pass because we just know that their expenses are, are going to be spread out and that's what they're going to charge. But I think maybe, maybe we could try to do a better job of monitoring their expenses so that those funds don't grow any bigger than they need to be and perhaps even adopt some policies to set some new parameters in place to, con to control their growth. I know there's great goals and great planning put into those funds for good reason, but I think maybe as a council we should get more involved in setting some guidelines for them to follow, and that's how we participate in keeping water rates low. You know, I think it is next week we vote on the uh, rate increases, and we could vote no, and it just affects the enterprise fund and how it's capitalized and how it's run. That's one way of doing it. But I don't know that that's the answer myself, struggling with this issue and this question. I, I, I think it comes down to controlling expenses for that fund and other funds like it. Uh, visiting with our newest member, Karski, Dean Karski, with the, uh, in the insurance business, Dean's got some ideas and thoughts, and I know it's, they've been talked about, but uh, that's just some thoughts I've been having because I've gotten a lot of phone calls a lot of pressure from others to keep these rates low and to not pass these rate increases. But in all fairness, we asked for these new sewers. We asked for these improvements, so we have to pay for them. So I'm struggling here in how to figure out how do we keep our rates low, but when we want a great sewer system or a water system. So I, I don't want to beat this to death, but I really think we should probably take a closer look at the expenses operating these funds, and I would encourage all of us to maybe Councillor Karski. I guess, uh, Councillor Jameson, and we did have the conversation. I know that each one of our enterprise funds has basically a base of 15% or a certain percentage of their operating revenues um, for their emergency fund. And we have each one of our enterprises with that um, banked money, basically. And do we need to have five separate savings accounts? Can we have one account maybe with a smaller amount total than we have for all five of them was kind of the idea I had. Just something to look at, a different way to maybe um, put our rainy day fund or our emergency fund aside for all of our enterprises funds instead of having one for each. So just a thought. Part of that discussion came when Councillor Karski and I were talking about it and you know, I think about a flood. If our city was inundated with a flood, which of those enterprises would be affected? Well, water and sewer for sure. 
But would landfill, perhaps? Probably not. And so the rainy day fund that the landfill has is sitting there waiting for another event that could challenge its functions. So just some thoughts. I thought were a fairy discussion and, and kind of even spurred my thinking as well further. And so I'm bringing it up today with the rest of you to help in this challenge. Councilor Erpenbach. Just a couple of comments. Um, number one, I, I'd remind you that when the sewer collapsed last summer, we were able to move as quickly as we could because there was a rainy day fund. Um, we were able to bring in the emergency equipment, the emergency piping just as fast as possible. And the other comment that I would make then is that I'm not hearing a whole lot from the folks that live in the neighborhoods that get their sewers backed up every summer. You know, and they know that part of this problem, that, or part of the solution that we're putting out this summer is going to alleviate a lot of those issues, again, in that Pam Road area west of Lincoln High School, in the 30th Street and Phillips Avenue area where, sewer, where people have taken sewage into their basements over and over and over again. And the city is being you know, as proactive as we can be, but it's gone on and on and on, and I don't hear those folks saying, don't raise the rates. I probably will get a couple calls now, but I am not hearing from those folks because they are going to benefit from it. And I'm not hearing from those folks that experienced, you know, and, and know what happened when the Tuthill lift sta station overflowed last year. It wasn't called the Big Poo River for nothing. You know, it was awful. We have to do better and this is a fair way to do it. Okay, Councillor Anderson. <clears throat> Just to add on to this, also, I, I don't know if I want to say this is something that people have asked for. This is something that we've had in the plans for a while. I believe in 2005, 2006, uh, south of the Augustana area, when we had the flooding and everything down there, um, in that area that we started looking proactively at our wastewater system and at that time Mr. Cotter wasn't uh, the head of public works so I don't know if that's something we can't put on you Mark but uh, I think we have to look at this as being uh, also that in the past there's been some bad planning as, as far as uh, you know replacement and paying attention to our wastewater sewage issues. We've allowed pipelines to get old. We've allowed pipelines to fail. We've allowed sewage to be in people's basements and we need to do something about it. So, and I don't, I haven't heard people say they don't want to pay for this, but they do question the timing right now due to people aren't getting raises, their utility bills are going up, their gas prices are going up. Um, <clears throat> I don't disagree with us having to pay for this either. I just agree with that the timing on this is, is not good for us or the citizens. So that's just a part of it that I wanted to bring out also. I, like I said, even the people that have told me, you know, it's going to hurt them do understand that, you know, this is something we have to do as we grow as a city. But we have to make sure that we take care of things as we move forward. We've had four years of double-digit raises in this fund. And I want to know how, I guess, my question to Mark Cotter and, and your staff is, do we, are we, is this going to get under control, or is this going to be something we're going to be looking at next year and the year on? I know Mark gave us a presentation uh, the other day, and I, and I would say that there is a stabilization time that it will get back to, uh, I think it's only within a couple of years, though, but it'll get down to a single digit increases. No, that was supposed to be this year. So now we're seeing double. So that's why I'm saying, is this going to be the last of the double, or are we going to see more doubles in the future? And that's, that's why I'm hoping we have a full assessment of what, are, what we're looking at here. And we've asked those questions in, you know, in the past. But still, we need to double check and make sure that we're on the right path here because I think in the future, these double digit increases are going to be something that's going to get questioned even further. Good questions for us to be ready for, Mark, when you uh, give us that uh, second reading. One other item I have is the uh, this naming rights study, we're going to have first reading tonight. 
Uh, I don't know how to uh, proceed, frankly. It's just uh, on this issue, but uh, any of it, anybody else have any comments before I give my rant? <laughs> Councilor Entman. Hard to gather my thoughts here a little bit, but uh, I think the mayor since the first of the year has been coming forward to us and telling us that if there was a need for additional funding, he was going to be right blunt and come forward and ask. He has never said since the first of the year that that's all that he was going to require. When you look at what the naming opportunities are, and if I look at, I think, comments that you even made last fall, Councillor Jamison, you mentioned, you know, if we're going to look at naming rights, let's not just be short-sighted and look at just for an event center, what other opportunities are there around the city for naming rights, such as at the Washington Pavilion, uh, such as the Arena and Convention Center, and also at the zoo. What other opportunities are there? I think as we go forward and we look at how are we going to fund this, uh, if it passes, how are we going to fund or what's part of the mayor's funding program, I think being able to identify what those opportunities are are important. A couple of people have made comments to me like, well, it's very simple. You just put it out for bid and the highest bidder gets it. Well, that might work for a building maybe, um, but what are the other opportunities? Uh, do they require segregation of a pizza stand, for example, in order to get naming rights on that pizza stand? What about the foyer? What about the bathrooms? Uh, there's all kinds of opportunities, I think, that are out there, but quite honestly, I'm not the professional. I don't know how to look at those and look at those opportunities. Um, and if you're building a new event center, it's been suggested that possibly those naming rights people should also be talking with the people that are doing the design work to make sure that those areas are identified properly to give them the, the proper exposure for that investment that they might be, whether it's in food service or whether it's in refreshments or whether it's somebody that wants to name a wing of a building in honor of their family or in memory of somebody else. Who knows what those opportunities are? Recently I had a chance to talk with a couple of other people too. You can't think about and limit ourselves to those people or businesses that are just in the Sioux Falls market. That in fact there are people throughout the country that are tied to this community somehow. Whether it's through family or friends or whether it's that they come hunting here and have had a great experience or an opportunity. Well those people might be in a position to be interested in becoming involved through naming rights or something like that. And it's my understanding a company like this would help to identify those. A company also from a national scale, whether it's a, a name brand beverage of some sort that might be out there. Who has the connections with those national companies to talk about what those opportunities are? Unfortunately, it costs money to do just about anything involved in a business today. We've come a long ways with this event center by, we're further than we ever have been. I've made that comment before. It's not now just a dream. It's, we're getting right down to the facts of what the building's going to look like, the amenities that are going to be included in it, and what the people are going to be able to go and vote on uh, if we're so lucky as to bring it to a vote in November. Um, is there a good time to ask for the additional money? You know, probably not. It's never a good time to ask for money. But at least if he comes and he asks for the money, which he's going to do, we have the, we, it will be up to us then to make the decision or whether to vote in favor of it or not. To me, it makes sense but I'm just a simple person out there that does run a business from time to time that looks at professionals to help me identify what those opportunities are. It's also my experience that professionals don't stand up and wave their arms for nothing. That you've got to pay the price. And I think right now we would not uh, be serving the citizens of Sioux Falls if, if we do not identify what those opportunities are for the funds that we might need for naming rights or what other investment opportunity it might be in a, in a public facility like this. But that's my comments, Councillor Jameson. And I thought I was going to rant. Uh, well, just 
respectfully, if I could clear up some confusion on the naming rights study issue. I think it was back during our budget presentation when it was determined that the entertainment, entertainment tax was not sufficiently funding the arena, the, pavi the pavilion, the convention center, and all of our city-owned assets. It was then that I said, if we know that, and we aren't selling the naming rights to these facilities, or looking at other opportunities to raise revenue, then we certainly should. There was no mention of doing a naming rights study to determine what those values should be. It was, it was a simple idea that if we sold the naming rights to the arena or any other building, that those dollars would be then put back into that building to help maintain it. Doing an, a study on the event center's naming rights, a proposed project for us, you know, I, I guess I, uh, I just can't believe that we have the color of the carpet of this place picked out, but we don't even know how we're going to pay for it. That seems to me the cart in front of the horse. And it's been this way all along for me in this $500,000 issue, and here we are looking for another 65 to keep it going, and it's just making me mad. I'm sorry. And I apologize to the group for, do, for getting upset, but it is just making me mad. <laughs> and I don't know what you guys think the most valuable asset that we have up here. I don't know what you know what, or think what that is, but I think it's public trust. And by, the, by saying something's going to, we're going to spend 500 to do this, and the council says, yes, go for it. And now here we are. We're out of money. We need more money. How can the public trust us to keep this in an equitable situation? Now all of a sudden we're just going to keep throwing money at it? When would we stop? When will we stop? As soon as public, the public trust says, well, just let the council do it. They don't really mind the, the P's and Q's of the whole subject. They'll just keep funding it. And then we erode our public trust. When the decision is made up to us to make a decision what's best for the public, they don't trust us. And that's what's making me mad here, is that's what we're eroding. Now, just because the mayor said he's going to be possibly coming to ask for more money and he's given us fair due notice, does that make it okay? I thought we sat here at quite some length, and I know I got the question called on me because I was trying to slow down the bus and everybody else wanted to keep going. And I was trying to stop and think about things just like this but we wouldn't take the time to do it. And here we are. Now what are we going to do? So I'm upset. I'm just I'm ranting. I know it. I don't have all my thoughts collected, but uh, just a couple other questions. What is, at what point, if I could get the city attorney's help here on this one, well, at what point do we have to require an RFP to be done for us to spend certain dollar amounts in the city? Councilor Jameson, basically uh, we use requests for proposals unless uh, the vendor is a, a sole source or such a specialized skill that that vendor has that they can give us one without an RFP. And the other way we do it is also if we want to seek competitive bids rather than seek RFP. But in terms of dollar amounts, it's competitive bids uh, have dollar amounts, but RFPs do not. I know that Director Smith said that he had had a review committee decide that it was superlative that should be doing a study. Does anybody know who that group is? And maybe, maybe you guys know why and how this name or selection was decided? Councilor Aguilar. Well, it's my understanding that this um, information will be given to us at tonight's meeting. I think that some of this discussion is putting the cart before the horse in that we have not had the presentation. I think a lot of these questions should be asked and answered at the council meeting tonight. Okay, fair enough. Let's save it for tonight's first reading. Anything else? All right, seeing none, I'll get off my little uh, tissy.
and uh, move on to our presentations with our first item was with, with the internal audit report from Rich Oaksell on the Great Plains Zoo and Delbridge Museum audit. Rich? Good afternoon, City Council. Uh, we have two reports on the agenda today. We'll, we'll go over that uh, zoo report first. Um, I'll go briefly over it because the audit committee had a fairly long discussion on, on that already. And we also have um, Elizabeth Wheely from the, the zoo and Don Kearney from Park and um, Karen Leonard from the uh, attorney's office. So if there's any questions that I can't answer, um, they'd be happy to answer those. Um, first of all, we'd just like to thank the uh, Park Department and uh, Elizabeth and her team for cooperation during the audit. We had no difficulties at all with this audit. And um, as you see on page five uh, of the report that Elizabeth Wheely and her team are doing a great job managing the zoo. The attendance has, is up. Um, the uh, zoo is expanding. Um, they receive about a $1.3 million operating subsidy or management fee, whatever you want to call it, each year from the city. So it's a substantial investment uh, each year by the city. And at the same time, the park department um, does a lot of the maintenance there. And uh, it's, uh, it's, it's a well-run zoo. We had five recommendations in our report. Um, two of them dealt with the transparency issue. Uh, recommendation three on page eight. Um, and recommendation four on page nine. Uh, recommendation three had to do with the IRS Form 990, which is an information return that all nonprofits have to uh, submit to the IRS. That was taken out of the, of the current agreement that was signed in October of last year. Um, we felt it was more of a transparency issue that, that it had been in there before and then it was taken out. Um, there was a concern expressed by the zoo about uh, donor information that would be on a 990 getting out. Um, the IRS will not release those, that information. Uh, they can redact that information on the, on the 990 that's available for the public to see. Um, so that we just felt that it's never a good idea to, um, to do away with the transparency issue. So we, we uh, disagreed with taking that out of the current agreement, that requirement. And that other recommendation on uh, number four, on, starting at page nine, uh, the requirement for an annual report by the zoo was taken out. Uh, the way the current agreement reads is it, by request, the park board uh, can request a report from the zoo, but it's not a requirement to have an annual report. We felt that was a transparency issue that, that um, uh, they should have an annual report available for the park board and for the city council. Um, the, the first recommendation, number one, uh, had to do with the dated agreement. It was, it was signed in October of, uh, of 2010, but it was, um, the way we read it, it was retroactive back to the beginning of the agreement in January of 2006, and we, we just kind of questioned why you would, uh, you know, assign an agreement in uh, October of 2010 and then have it going back to uh, January of 06. Um, there's an explanation from the uh, attorney's office there uh, to our recommendation. But the, um, I'd like to spend a little more time on what we thought were a little bit more serious uh, recommendations. And number two on page six, that was the transfer of animals. Uh, the way it worked before this uh, agreement, um, that was the new agreement, the city owned the zoo, um, all the, the buildings, uh, um, all, the, all the assets, the, the animals, and the Zoological Society would run the zoo on our behalf. Under the new agreement, the, the animals belonged to the Zoological Society. And we felt like the, we didn't see any advantage for the city to allow the, the animals to be uh, turned over to the uh, Zoological Society. We did some research on our large, uh, well-known zoos like the San Diego Zoo, uh, Dallas Zoo, uh, San Francisco Zoo, among others, where uh, the situation is that the city owns the zoo, they own the animals, and they just have a Zoological Society run the zoo. So we, we didn't see any advantage to having the city turning the animals over to the, uh, to the Zoological Society. Under the present management, uh, we feel like there's a very good working relationship. We didn't see a big threat there, but the problem was if, if you didn't have the current management team there, um, if the relationship between the, uh, the society and the city would deteriorate uh, like it did back in 2005, you could have some, some issues there. So that's what we were concerned about, uh, the, the potential. Um, and then recommendation number five on page nine had to do with a $75,000 loan uh, back in 2000, there was a, a need for, for cash flow for the zoo. Uh, the city um, 
gave them an advance of 75000 for operating funds uh, with the expectation in 2005 that it would be paid back. Uh, that um, date to be paid back was extended. And then finally, in I think a, uh, uh, September of 2006, uh, finance had cut a check for 75000 sent it to the zoo, and then uh, like a week later, they sent the money uh, back to the city. And in a sense, the, the essence of the transaction, as far as we could tell, was a forgi forgiveness of the loan. Uh, one issue was that the city council had originally uh, agreed to this advance back in 2000, but there was no advice and consent from the, the council when that uh, money uh, came back. Um, so uh, we felt like there was an issue of uh, perhaps the, the city council should have been at least advised of that or, or their consent for that. Uh, and we thought it, it seemed convoluted the way the, the, you know, cutting a check and mailing it and then getting a check back. Uh, we thought perhaps a journal entry would have worked. Um, there was a rec the response from finance, you, you can read that for yourself. They, they had a justification for the, the way they did that. Um, as I said, we had no issues uh, dealing uh, with uh, Elizabeth and her team or with the park department. Everybody's very cooperative, and uh, they're doing a great job of managing the zoo. So if there's any questions at this time, we'll attempt to answer those. So. Any questions for Rich? Councillor Brown. Rich, that agreement uh, from October of 2010, refresh my memory, I don't think the council was involved in that agreement, was it not? Was it administration only? I believe so. If I'm... I don't think so. I don't so. remember it. No, I don't, I don't it, remember that. Would, the would that be an example of the kinds of agreements that, that yes. we've, you would recommend that yeah. the council be I would recommend any time you're dealing with an agreement to manage a public facility such as a zoo that the city council would um, uh, sign off on that. It would come before the council for their approval and that you would know, you know what was being changed from the, the previous agreement. Otherwise, it's very difficult for the council. Yes. To make implement changes that internal audit suggests. Exactly, and that this agreement, by the way, uh, at the end of this year, it will expire. So, um, I, I imagine shortly that uh, work will be done on on a new agreement. So, goes back to what you've talked about, Jim. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Councilor Anderson. Richard, go in a little more detail about this loan. I guess when it was originally done, when was the money originally transferred? And then the second transfer, I guess. Okay. Um, in December of 2000, there was a resolution. So it went before the council for, for council action as a resolution to authorize a $75,000 interest-free loan to the zoo. In other words, they are having some cash flow issues. We were going to loan them. Uh, and uh, that was, uh, it was supposed to be a five-year um, loan, interest-free loan. So in October 2005, that money was due from the zoo. Um, but uh, there was an agreement. Um, by agreement, the due date was extended to March in 2006. But then it, was in, it wasn't until September of 2006 that actually there was money uh, sent from finance over to the zoo. And then uh, like a week or 10 days later, um, money came from the zoo back to the city. And um, that basically paid off the note. But there was no city council involvement except at, at the very beginning in, in, the year, in the 2000 when they, uh, by resolution, authorized an interest-free loan. So is, does that kind of make sense? Or? Yes. Okay. All right. Rich, and as, as far as the ownership of the animals today, they are, today they are owned by? Well, the way we read it is the society has they, they have the animals. That's the way we read it. Um, I think um, we did not see any advantage to the city in, in, in um, allowing the Zoological Society to have control over the animals. We understand there's, uh, there's constant loaning of animals in, in, in the zoo world that, that uh, typically, you know, animals typically aren't sold from our understanding that you, you, you make trades with other zoos, uh, maybe long-term trades, but there's a lot of exchanging of animals. Um, the zoo, I think the, the reason they wanted that in, in, their, in the new agreement was to give them flexibility to do that, to manage the zoo. Um, I don't think there was ever intention that they were going to, you know, sell the animals and, and pocket the money. I, you know, that, that's kind of absurd to think that that would happen. But, um, you know, there's strange things that have happened. We, we had a case that we came across in Tampa, Florida, where the, uh, the zoo director in Tampa was setting up his own private zoo. 
in the Tampa area, and he was transferring some animals from the Tampa Zoo to his private animal park. Um, now, you'd think that'd be strange, but it was, it was going on. We don't think that would ever happen in Sioux Falls, but, uh, you know, we, we just didn't think it was in the city's interest to, to sort of give up the, the, the animals that way. So that, that was our concern, that uh, we didn't see any, int any uh, benefit to the citizens to happen. And to change. before that change in the agreement, the, the city the, the owned the, had, had had the had the buildings and the and the animals, and we just had the society run the zoo, manage the zoo. And forest. they were still able to loan out animals and. Yeah, that's our point. Before before October 2010, apparently we were able to loan animals and and just you know that sort of thing. It didn't seem to be a problem. Um, and apparently in other zoos like the the Dallas Zoo and the San Diego Zoo, it's not an issue, where the city maintains control of the animals. And they're still able to make the the trades and the loans, and so on. So, but but they're uh, in the future working towards different uh, a new agreement that will outline this whole organization differently. Is that right? Well, that's my understanding. I don't know if if, uh, if uh, somebody from administration wants to speak about that, but in the future there'll be a different agreement. Yeah, yeah, today. because this one expires in yeah. December this year, so we'll have to have either you know extension or a new agreement. Something that has to be done, so we'll have to. That'll be coming up soon. So, any other questions for Rich on the side? Okay, Rich, go ahead. You got another one here. Okay, the second report is um, it's that follow up on status of recommendations. And uh, as I was explained to uh, our, our newest council member, uh, Mr. Karski, um, and his orientation, we have an internal audit charter. And part of our charter is, is it's kind of our marching orders, what we're supposed to be doing, what our mission is, or what our vision is. And, and part of our vision is to be a catalyst for positive change. And, and the, the way you do that is if you're making recommendations, um, you know, you, you hope some of them are implemented. You hope the majority are implemented and you have positive change. And, um, and it's also uh, you know, required in our audit charter to have a follow-up process in place. And it's also required by professional audit standards. Uh, it's not good enough to just to make a recommendation, you put in a report, and then you move on to your next project and you don't revisit what you recommended. So what we do um, is, is we basically um, we, we get in touch with the directors, and uh, these are basically self-reported. We ask them the status of, of something that we don't know the status of. You know, have, have you agreed to this? Is, is this accomplished yet? Or is this, uh, what's the status of this recommendation? When we cycle through that area again uh, at a, in a future date, then we will verify that those recommendations were in fact implemented. But uh, for the most part, we're, we're, we're basing um, the, uh, the status upon what the directors are telling us. And um, some of the issues are not easily corrected. There's, there's issues that we identified in previous audits with, the, with our software. And as you know, we've, uh, we're making the steps to uh, have new software uh, for land management and, and finance. Uh, we've had that same software since 1992, and that's caused uh, some issues that cannot uh, be resolved by management. When we come up with a, a certain audit issues, you know, it's a software issue. Um, but for the most part, management has been very responsive. Um, by my count, we have the majority of recommendations that we've uh, made have been either implemented or in progress or partially implemented. Um, as far as the format of the report, uh, you know, it, we try to very briefly give like a one sentence a summary of the recommendation and a very brief explanation of what, what the status is. Uh, the one um, uh, place where we, we changed that format was in the very last report starting at page eight, that uh, special project code enforcement report that we did back in November of 2008. Uh, we, had, we made five recommendations. And uh, you received a report uh, a few weeks ago from Kevin Smith, who, who's the, the team leader now for code enforcement, giving you kind of the status of where we're at. And, and uh, so that report goes back over two years ago. And uh, although they, they didn't um, implement it precisely our recommendations, I, I think there's definitely a, a progress noted. And you can see the uh, more of an expanded explanation of where uh, administration is at on those uh, those uh, five recommendations in that report. So uh, if there's any specific questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Any questions for Rich? Councilor Anderson. Rich, is there going to be another uh, follow-up? As I've seen one that, like on the Multicultural Center, we were 
I've been looking for a follow-up on that one. Yeah, we, um, we, we kind of have a, a schedule of when we, we go back, and so that there will be up on our next cycle of, of, of asking the, uh, the current director what's the status. I think we had, I want to say, 14 or 20 recommendations. We had a lot of recommendations, and so we'll probably be going back there, and uh, uh, then that will be on our next report when we do our follow-up. Um, uh, the status of those recommendations. Sometimes it, it takes a while to, to implement things. Um, sometimes you know you have to give management a little bit of time. If it's a, a critical issue, something that's you know just really important, the audit committee would say no, you need to follow up on that like immediately. We would do that. Most of these are, are routine, uh, and, and you just have a kind of a schedule of following up. So does that answer your question, yeah, Council? I'll talk to you about it later. Okay. okay thank you. Okay. Any other questions for Rich? All right, Rich, thanks for your help. Okay, thank you. Any other items we need to discuss tonight? Uh, seeing none, then we'll move uh, for a, uh, an adjournment. We want to do the uh, Public Services Committee, and if we could start that at uh, 4.55. Uh, let's start it at 5. 5? Yeah, please. Okay, Councilor Chair would like to start that at... Or, Committee Chair would like to start that at 5, 5 o'clock, so this meeting is adjourned.